Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1971, just as I am from Bill Withers. This is, of course, our Bill Withers tribute. Um, I saw earlier that he actually passed away like a couple of days before the last time we recorded. But I don't really? think we heard about it until last weekend. Yeah, yeah, I don't recall hearing about it until after we recorded. Yeah, because very shortly thereafter, I messaged you and was like, we have to do a Bill Withers tribute. <laughs> Bill Withers was an American singer-songwriter who was best known for his songs Lean On Me, of course, Ain't No Sunshine, and Just the Two of Us. Withers worked as a professional musician for just 15 years, from 1970 to 1985, after which he moved on to other occupations. <laughs> Could not find what they were, but I was kind of curious about that. I thought he was still in music, because um, I just heard an interview... Uh, by Ron Bennington, and in fact, I think I could post it uh, a link for to Sirius XM because that's free right now. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it still sounded like he was, you know, still trying to come up with music, hmm. and it was pretty late in his life. Uh-huh. But who knows what he was doing? Well, yeah, there was also a documentary about him recently, which may have sparked some interest. That's what he was promoting, I think, oh, at the okay. time. Okay. Yeah. Maybe he was thinking about a comeback. Um, yeah. Just As I Am is Withers' debut album. It was released on May 1st, 1971 on Sussex Records, produced by Booker, Booker T. Jones. Yes, that Booker T. And Stolen features, from sax. <laughs> and features Bill Withers on vocals and guitar, Stephen Stills on guitar, Booker T. Jones. I was surprised by that. <laughs> yeah, Booker T. Jones on guitar, keys, and arrangements. I didn't know Booker T. played guitar. Donald Duck Dunn on bass, Chris Etheridge on bass, Jim Keltner on drums. If you were around at all in the 80s, you've heard of Jim Keltner's name a few times. Uh, Al Jackson Jr. on drums and Bobby Hall on percussion. Bobby Hall has a hell of a discography. She has played on like everything that was released (laughs) in the 70s and 80s. That was at all big. So this is a serious all-star cast. Um, a reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes, but down in the description, you'll find links to Just As I Am on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. Um, by the way, I have to mention a uh, warning for the last song, Better Off Dead. It is very explicitly about suicide. Holy if that is shit, an, man. If that is an issue for you, do not listen to it. <laughs> yeah, like... Every other song he's, well, actually before up to moaning and groaning, mm-hmm. like every other song, he's very ambiguous about, you know, like right. things like in my heart. And, you have and no idea. Moaning and groaning, but, a title aside, is fairly ambiguous. No, he's, I think he's quite explicit. Like you're twice the woman I thought you'd be mm-hmm. and stuff like. <laughs> but no, he gets know, the I mean, better off dead. Yeah. And... and then, yeah, the better off dead. And that is just, I mean. We'll get to I hope it. you take this the wrong way and yeah. misinterpret what I say as the Bloodhound gag would. Yeah, say. yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> Starting with track one, Harlem. The album is basically a combination of folk and soul, which yeah. works beautifully. It's very unexpected, uh, really. I mean, I don't know why it's unexpected, but you, you just expect straight up soul here. Mm. And Harlem kind of has a, a more of a soul feel yeah. than a folk feel. But there's a very prevalent acoustic guitar, which was, I think, Withers. And, you know, it's there's these string parts, that, and there are no string players listed on the album. That's interesting. Like, uh... And I'm wondering, because um, Booker T is listed as keyboards, could it be a Mellotron? I don't know. It sounds too too good, because yeah, a Mellotron is... Yeah, it's maybe 71. they just didn't list them. Um, I do like how the arrangement just kind of gradually builds as the song goes on. It's a lot like the Doors song, uh, Queen of the Highway, mm-hmm. which is, I don't think it's a very known, very well-known Doors song. <laughs> <laughs> but you could see Booker T uh, probably digging on Ray Man's Eric. Uh-huh. But it, it does get a bit monotonous. It's, it's this one progression, this one basically verse that continues yeah. as the song goes. Um, it's a bit boring to me 
about three quarters of the way through, there's a welcome change where the arrangement does switch up a little bit and the rhythm changes a bit. I mean, uh, you kind of wish for more. Like, he just gives you this little picture of, you know, this Harlem street scene mm. of people leaving for, you know, get, getting up for church in the morning and uh, the party is coming home and people selling shit. And... Yeah. Um, all of the songs are pretty short. Um, it's also odd to begin the album with because yeah. this is obviously not a single. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just this weird slice of life thing that he, you're just kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Is this a concept album? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, inter- the album is interesting in terms of how it's laid out. Um, yeah. Because it starts really good. Kind of, I'm giving away a bit here, but it kind of dips in the middle. And then, or not quite the middle. But then the last half is fucking brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that the last half is a lot of curveballs. <laughs> mm-hmm. On to track two. My, I'll say one of my favorites. I actually have three favorites. I couldn't narrow it down. Um, first of my favorites, track two, Ain't No Sunshine. One of my absolute favorite songs of all yeah. time. The song that made me aware of Bill Withers. Of course. I mean... There's Lean On Me and, and you know, okay, that's nice and stuff. Mm, yeah. But this, this isn't a pop song. No. It's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a movie in two minutes. It's only two minutes long. And it's and you're two just verses. Like, right. That are very similar. It's a blues song. It's just the common yeah. response, oh, yeah. repetitive blues thing. But only once, very short. But... And it's there's this the I know I know section in the middle, which could be really fucking annoying, but the groove makes it work. I wish I could remember where I heard the story of that, like that you know he he had it was in the demo, mm-hmm. and they're like, what what is that? And he's like, oh, I'm still working on that verse. I don't uh-huh. know what I'm gonna put in there, so I just did that as a placeholder. And they mm-hmm. were like, it's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Probably, you know, Booker T. Mm-hmm. But it just starts with voice and guitar and maybe a foot yep. tap. And there's this really noticeable reverb on his voice, mm-hmm. which just works perfectly. And then the strings come in, and I've always been on the fence about those strings. Because I've heard later versions of it where without the strings or with a full band. I don't know which I prefer. I think I'd go with the strings just because this song is so cinematic. Yeah, fair point. And I'm going to use that word a bunch of times in this review, probably, <laughs> because his lyrics are just so cinematic. Because what is going on with this relationship? I mean, emotional dependency is a theme that I think he returns to. Yeah. Many times in the future, lovely and it day. It doesn't really seem that dependent at this point. It's just you know he misses her when she's gone, and, and the world's not the same. It's it's that typical melodramatic love song we've all been yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it doesn't read as particularly dependent. It's the middle section that's interesting. <laughs> the I know, I know, I know, I know. I had to leave the young thing alone. That ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Like, well, right. Did he do something that drew? Does he keep doing something that drives her away? Yeah. D- was she cheating? Is she out like running around on him? You know, is this like um, what's that? Uh, Don't bring your love to town right. song. You know, uh, you, you know, like. But and this you is... get the feeling only darkness every day. Yeah. I think suggests that she quote unquote goes away. Every time very... she goes away, yeah. For a very long stretch of time. Mm-hmm. Or at least regularly. Yeah. I, and this it, is the first one that really shows off his voice. Right. You really get a sense of what he could do vocally. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And and really repetitive, which I normally hate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only two minutes. Yeah, There's I guess it's so much rep- You can cram so much in there. Right. Even though there's repetition. And then the eye knows. It, it just... It just drives point his, his insanity, you know, <laughs> like just how crazy he is because she's not there. 
16, 20 of them. I just counted if I'm or about that. 20 no, I knows. He, he was supposed to have written another verse for it yeah. and just. Well, it's sort of placeholder in. Well, it would have effectively been a bridge between the two verses. Because yeah. the rhythm is a little different and the chords are different there. But yeah. On to track three Grandma's Hands. I love the way it starts off with just guitar and hi hat. And the rest of the band comes in very subtly. It's this very uh, primal beat. Yeah. It's, I don't think he uses anything like it in the mm-hmm. rest of the album. Yeah. It's it's a unique... That I think that's what's interesting about this album is that there's a lot of different experiments, you know, with music here. Yeah. And the groove on this one kind of reminds me a bit of some of the Shaft music. I think this is... I think a little bit predates. before. Yeah, yeah. So I'm well, wondering if I mean, Isaac borrowed a bit. Well, let's be honest. Did, didn't Booker T play? Oh, that's true. He did. Prob- probably. I'm not sure offhand, but yeah. I well, who be knows? Because, I mean, if if they lured him from Stax and, and mm-hmm. Isaac was still with Stax at the, that time. Right. Like, who knows? Yeah. It just remi- yeah. The groove reminds me a lot of it. I don't think we've done a Stax yet, have we? Hmm. This is the closest we've come to yeah. a Stax. Risa wasn't Stax, right? What's that? Risa. I thought she was Motown. You're, okay, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, because it was, you know, Muscle Shoals and all of that. So yeah. I wasn't sure. Um, but love the groove once the bass comes in. Withers could kind of speak and sing at the same time. <laughs> there, There's that Isaac Hayes. It's interesting because I, I always thought the two of them is like end, different ends of the spectrum. That Isaac Hayes is much more expressive about from the, from the musical perspective. Mm-hmm. Whereas for Bill Withers, it's much more of a lyrical approach. Uh-huh. And well, I he, mean, he is very bit much, of, at least at this point in his career, was very much a folky singer songwriter type, just with a strong soul influence. I mean, the story in that interview is that he was just this factory worker who just, while he was in the middle of doing the repetition all day, mm-hmm. just came up with these songs and put a demo together. <laughs> <laughs> so he, <laughs> and here we go. Yeah. On to track four, Sweet Wanomi. This is where it starts to fall apart a little bit for me. The groove is very much of its time. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the first chill song. It's kind of the first song you feel like you can relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after, the first, after the first three. I mean, Grandma's Hands, of course, is a sweet song, but right. there's still, it's still, you know, everybody misses their grandmother. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's what he always went for was, you know, universal feelings right. to to encapsulate in just a couple minutes right, right. um and this one I, it is chill but it just kind of lost my attention particularly after the keyboard solo um i don't think all the strings were necessary um his voice does elevate it um and of course this one isn't ambiguous either he's i mean right. it's pretty straightforward yeah. Yes, they're um, fucking. <laughs> well, it, in fact, it was my pick for the weakest until the next one. <laughs> oh, the next one? Oh, the Midnight Cowboy cover? Mm-hmm. On to track five, Everybody's Talking. Originally written and recorded by Fred Neal in 66, best known for the Harry Nelson 1968 cover, which was featured in Midnight Cowboy. I actually kind of like the Nelson version. You know, I did not even recognize this until, no. like, the second listen. I was like, wait a minute, I know this song. <laughs> it's his opening acoustic groove that he'd already used about two, you know, two or three times at this point. It was getting a bit old. It um, reminds me a lot of Otis, this song, just where, where the, his voice is the main instrument, mm-hmm. and he's just carrying the thing along. the play, And the band, you feel like they're just going to play behind him for as long as he'll go. <laughs> But the change in the groove was really just to show off that he could rearrange a song, not to serve <laughs> it. You know, the original arrangement really serves as a song. Or the Nelson version again. I don't know the original, but the Nelson version serves the lyric. You know, there's that why, why, why section, that, you know, toward the end. And I, that's, that's just what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um so this is my that's my pick for weakest. And then it gets interesting. I was gonna pick this one for my weakest. Uh six? Yeah. Do it good? 
Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's kind of a weird turn for the album, I felt. Very weird, but I love that about it. It's got this kind of jazzy opening groove. He really and Steven Stills, you know. There's a sitar solo, which I loved. It's got to be Stills on this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, Stills is all the lead guitar. There's only, He's the only other guitar player credit. I know. I think a lot of it's Withers. Oh, my be. I, I, I assume that he just played the acoustic parts. I, so yeah. I, I yeah, assumed yeah. that any electric is Stills. But the sitar is definitely stills. Yes, definitely. And the, the yeah, just that whole Crosby Stills Nash kind of feel. It's these really psychedelic lyrics, and then he just speaks the middle. <laughs> he pretty much gives all of minor notes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much in the middle of the song. This is one of my other favorites. I I, I just loved it. It's completely absurd. On to track seven, she'll be happier. This is the Bill Withers we love. This has a really nice moody opening that reminded me a lot of Pink Floyd. Hmm. Um, Crazy Diamond, particularly, it reminded me of the, the guitar arpeggio in the groove. Wow. I don't, I'll have to come back to that, that one. Um, I love the timing contrast between the guitar and the vocal and how it just glacially builds. And it's it's just this really pretty simple song. Um, love no the drums. effect on "But She's Gone." He holds the note forever. Yeah, and and it, there's this kind of weird effect on it. Um, and just nice to see them getting into some studio tricks. Uh, he gets and yeah, psychedelic again a little bit. And then for seventy one though, I mean, we're talking real interesting the you know, studio tricks. Yeah. You've uh, listened to a lot of albums from this year, and it's it's they weren't exactly ahead technologically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you did it the old-fashioned way at this point, you know, yes. the slates and and springs and all of that. Right. So, I mean, it's just desolate and depressed and mm-hmm. struggling to get through. And yeah, what do you think? A lot on the side. I mean, this is the beginning of the second side. Yeah. A lot of this side is without drums, which is kind of, mm-hmm. there are a lot of interesting choices to do songs without drums. It kind of reminds me of Pink Floyd, The Wall, actually, because there are a lot of songs on mm-hmm. that where there are no drums. There are no, there aren't a lot of drums, but um, a lot of percussion. Bobby Paul shows off a lot. I, I yeah. had to call her out in a couple. Um, on to track eight, Let It Be. This is a Beatles cover. And he turns into a gospel song <laughs> he to use the cliche he takes it to church um this time the timing change works and honestly it is a gospel song yeah. it was a gospel song staring us in the face all along it, it works especially when the acoustic guitar comes in i think his vocal is a little more monotone than paul mccartney's was yeah. you know he doesn't jump around as much as mccartney did right um that's really my only criticism of it. I like what they did with the rhythm and, and you know, how they made it a little more interesting. I mean, yeah, the clapping, the, you know, Booker T's, keyboards, mm-hmm. it, it is just, and again, no drums. Yeah. It's just, uh, you're, you're in church and, you know, singing about Mother Mary and you, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely a surprising, like, wow, this really works. Mm-hmm. On to track nine, I'm her daddy. I was very relieved that this was, did not go lyrically where I was concerned it would go. <laughs> the, um, the kick in's pretty jarring on this, considering how low and monotone the past, like, mm, the bongos pretty- at the beginning just gave me chills. Yeah. Um, this is where Bobby Hall started to impress me. I need to buy bongos now. Um, the drums, <laughs> there are drums on this one. Um, because yes. they come in and it gets real, even more interesting. Like um, when it kicks in, you're just like, what? <laughs> yeah, well, because there's a really complex groove at the beginning. And then the drums come in and it simplifies a lot, but it's still really interesting. Um, this was almost the fourth favorite of mine. Um, yeah, I just have to cut some notes about Bobby Hall, who's amazing. It, I, yeah, it's one I definitely want to hear mm-hmm. more times to really digest i mean stills is playing like this slower version of spooky which is <laughs> yeah. kind of odd i thought but mm-hmm. on to track 10 in my heart begins very folky 
and actually, it's all I say begins because I, I it was the beginning when I taped that. The entire song is very folky, right. and it's, it's just loosely timed guitar. guitar and vocal thing. And uh, I mean, I think the Eagles took this for the intro to Hotel of California. Mm-hmm. I think Genesis took this for Supper, the intro <laughs> to Supper's Ready, mm-hmm. which you know, the, I guess the two are very similar now. Yeah. Um, um, this might be a fourth favorite. Um, his best vocal on the album. It's crazy beautiful. It, yeah. And it's just, I mean, this one's ambiguous because, you know, it's just <laughs> this guy who, you know, I, I don't know what he doesn't seem to have a whole lot but he has this picture and he's like committing this picture to memory or keeping it in his heart. And it's just <laughs> the way he sings it though. Yeah. God damn. And I, like I said, I knew, um, ain't no sunshine. I, I discovered that song in high school. So I wasn't surprised by a lot of the folky acoustic stuff on the album. I didn't expect it to go this folky. Yeah. The, yeah. This is where it's, this is practically, I brought my love a cherry folky. <laughs> It's like this weird combination of blues and folk. Mm -hmm. I mean. (laughs) And that timing kind of settles in toward the end and they do find a groove. But at the very end. I thought it was just him, really. Well, it could have been him on a guitar. Yeah, that's true. I'm assuming it's a second guitarist. It could be um, Withers. On to track 11, Moanin' and Groanin'. Yes, it's about (laughs) exactly what you think it is. (laughs) <laughs> and has this amazing groove. Bobby Hall made me respect the tambourine. <laughs> what she did with the tambourine was inspired. I mean, he goes full on Ray Charles here. <laughs> uh, with vocal overdubs for the first time on the album, like kind of duetting himself. Yeah. The drums were in my left ear and I didn't care. I normally hate pan drums. I don't think I noticed. And there's no bass. Really? Percussion, drums, vocals, guitar, and keys. No uh, no bass. I was listening because I was expecting it to come in at some point. And, and an gr- amazing groove for not having a bass. Yeah. Yeah, this... <laughs> it, this is... He gets a bit funky, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, naturally so here. <laughs> And finally, track 11, Better Off Dead. This is the one I warned you about at the beginning. 12, I believe, right? Oh, sorry, track 12. This is the one I warned you about at the beginning. And not a bad religion cover. I can't (laughs) resist that joke when I have the opportunity. Did they use this in the John Cusack movie? I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, suicide warning on this one. Um, Love the congas at the beginning. Uh, Again, Bobby Hall. I... She was on it, like I said, a ton of stuff. Carly Simon, James Taylor, like yeah. on that level, you know, throughout the seventies and eighties. Um, I gotta go listen to that stuff and and hear, listen, pay attention to her. She's incredible. Uh, love the syncopated bass, this amazing groove, really dark lyrics. Yes, bleak even by his standards. Yes, yeah. and it's this great mix of folk, soul, and blues because he goes properly blues on this one. Right. I think musically, this and the first track are probably the most complex mm, yeah. for the whole um, album. So they kind of bookend uh, nicely. Yeah, like you feel like you get this experience. I was still typing this line because it caught my attention when the ending happened. <laughs> now I must die by my own hand because I'm not man enough to live alone. The whole fucking lyrics. The whole and, fucking lyrics are just... And then after that line, a gunshot. Just and they a cold ending. Yeah. In more ways than one. Mm. I mean, just the, this whole like yeah, these lyrics. <laughs> and they thought Judas Priest. Yeah. <laughs> like... Well, I mean, you know, heavy metal gets a rap for, you know, dark lyrics. Fucking murder ballads. Yeah. And I don't mean the Nick Cave album. I mean the inspiration for the Nick Cave album. Right. You know, old folk murder ballads, old blues got super dark. You know, it's funny. uh, I was just watching the movie Raising Arizona like a few weeks back. 
and she's singing to the baby a murder ballad <laughs> lullaby. Mm-hmm. So you know, even old country. I mean, that's that's the joke about old country is you know how it's about you know your do- you know your wife leaving you with your horse and your car and blah blah blah, and crying in your beer music, you know. But in old... the old days, it was you fucking shot him. Yeah, you know that's what music was before pop happened. But yeah, this 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 story is not ambiguous. No, not the slightest. <laughs> like we, we know exactly what he gives us every detail here as to how the relationship went to shit, and it was he's taking responsibility that it was all his fault, and there was nothing nothing he could really do about it. And yeah, it just ends with the gunshot. And when you were saying that, um, you know, Sunshine was kind of an obsessive relationship. No, this is the obsessive relationship <laughs> song. It, well, it's funny because like Ain't No Sunshine, uh, Lean On Me, Lovely Day, they're mm-hmm. all like emotional dependent relationships, you know, where you know, like Lean On Me, he's offering, you know, the, you know, to be the, the the support. I don't know if Lean on Me is an unhealthy emotional dependency. No, 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 no. Well, oh, okay. you know what? That's the thing. He never says if it's healthy or not. Mm. He, does, he, he, he leaves that up to your imagination. Fair. Is he overly obsessive? Is, yeah. you know, has he chased her away? Does he keep chasing her away? Well, the ending of the song is what's the unambiguous part in, in every way. Oh, well, this, I mean... Well, yeah, he... you know, Sunshine, it's a little ambiguous, yeah. Yeah. Um, Lovely Day, I'm not as familiar with. I mostly know it from a commercial. Well, Lovely Day, it begins, and he's, like, you know, just really, like, sad or kind of hungover, I guess, uh-huh. or something. And it's when he looks at his love he, is when the strings kick in and then and, and that chorus, Lovely Day, you know, and okay. everything. So it, it's he's kind of he's taking both sides of it and you're kind of mm-hmm. thinking like well wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> just how you know dependent is he on this love mm-hmm. and what the fuck is wrong with him if anything <laughs> he makes you wonder he keeps you guessing and thinking back to probably his last hit just the two of us probably actually it was probably the first bill Withers song i ever heard um because yeah, it came out in like eighty five, um, it's kind of this dark, moody chorus, and then he gets to this just the two of us chorus, or I think it's dark moody verse. Five, I think, I think I remember hearing it like on WKRP. It might have been yeah. before then. Yeah, I think it, it like might have been early eighties. Um, I'm thinking like seventy eight, maybe. It was the eight, it was definitely eighties. Yeah, um, but might have been earlier than eighty five. Um. But it's you know, this kind of dark verse, moody verse, and then it gets to this upbeat chorus, just the two of us. So he yeah. does, he did continue that approach. Right, exactly. You're right. Yeah, that is the, how that song's structured too. It is just about this guy who's feeling loneliness and and he just finds, uh, you know, happiness with someone mm-hmm. else. And you know, you can take it for you know, like oh, isn't that nice? Or you can be like. Wow, is he um is he all right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of like Ain't No Sunshine. I've always loved yeah. that song because, like, in my you know emo days, and I don't mean like stylistically emo. I just mean like moody adolescent days. I've really related to it. Of course, yeah. There's never I mean been a kid that that hasn't gone through, you know, the relationship mm-hmm. where they were just too emotionally dependent on somebody else, or you know. And then you're just like, oh, man. <laughs> I Thanks to my therapist, now. I've gotten a little past that stuff. But it's not, not well, I, I say adolescent, but, you know. Um, but I think the Bill Withers in general, amazing fucking songwriter. Yeah. Um, amazing vocalist. I think our generation was done a bit of a disservice in, with him. Yeah. Because we got way tired of Lean On Me. <laughs> first there was the movie that got it overplayed and then there was who who the hell covered it uh oh man early 90s i want to say no it was like a late 80s was it late 80s okay i had the name on my head earlier because i remember i i think i'd actually heard the cover first Same here. yeah <laughs> and then you know the movie came out lean on me Club- about 
Nouveau. It just hit oh, my head. God. I swear to God, I did not Google that. I haven't heard that name in <laughs> you did not hear like anything over in my 30 head. years. Um, <laughs> but it was in my in my brain earlier today, and it, it bounced back now. And it got horribly, horribly overplayed. And then the movie came out, and even the Bill Withers version got horribly, horribly overplayed. And so it what? kind of put us off Bill Withers in a lot. In a I way. think like the, the cover was horrendous because oh, it was yeah. just. You know, and this had, Bill Withers had me thinking when I even first heard, before I even knew we were doing this, it's kind of the the role of the singer. You know, you can have mm-hmm. the technically perfect, you know, voice, mm-hmm. or you can be a good actor. Right. And and when you have both, it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like Freddie Mercury oh, or really? Jim Morrison. Or I, I, Morrison was more actor. Morrison was more of an actor. And yeah. Freddie, all due respect, was much more of a technician. Uh, I, I think Freddie was definitely an actor. He was a course. decent actor, but they, he had his limits. He was definitely a technician. <laughs> um, it's James Hetfield, early Metallica as an actor, <laughs> right. late Metallica, where he decided he was going to be a singer. Right. But but Withers, yeah, did kind of have it both. I think he leaned more actor. Yes. But he he had it technically. I think I think he leaned more actor because it was more about making the song mm-hmm. you know well you wrote and, right it was about it was about completing the picture of the song he he wrote them and he clearly cared about his lyrics yeah you know it wasn't like um i, I hate to bring these up i'm gonna horrible i mean i'm gonna date myself because i date myself every week on this show um <laughs> joe elliott from def leppard who has flat out said he writes lyrics that sound good <laughs> Which is why you have songs like Armageddon it. <laughs> you know, pour some sugar on me. They sounded good. Meaning is irrelevant to him. And those weren't even the embarrassing Def Leppard songs. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wow. I mean, the embarrassing ones were like, you know, let's get rocked. Oh, and... yeah. Okay. So <laughs> slightly later. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. It's good. always funny when you hear hair metal people complain about grunge killing hair metal. Hair metal killed hair yeah, metal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, there was some self parody happening 90s, way before grunge came in. If you look at that early '90s hair metal, it yeah. was awful. Yeah. <laughs> Just Trickster. they're defending it. Trickster, Firehouse. Um, it became a self parody well before gr- grunge finished it off. Um, right. But um, cherry pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Need I say more? <laughs> But then you have the opposite end of the spectrum, something like Withers, who clearly cared and had something to say. Like you could pick to the fact that I could pick apart lyrics from a two minute song, like, mm-hmm. yeah, but every time she goes away. Right. <laughs> you know, you're just like that's a detail. That means something. He didn't just put that in there mm-hmm. for the hell of it. He's telling a story. Yeah. Which is everything on this except the one we disagreed on. I can't believe you didn't love um, Do no, Do It Good. <laughs> it's know. just so I, weird. It is. It is a very weird turn. I'll give it that. So, moot point, but would you recommend it? <laughs> of course. I I am definitely going to listen to this one again. I mean, I'll probably listen to the second one, too. Cause hmm. Yeah, I'll give that one another shot. I've always it, been a fan it, of Lovely Day. We were between the first and second albums, and... I, I I was gonna go with the second one because it's the one a lot of people recommended. You would pu- push to the first one, and I'm glad you did because yeah. Lean on Me is in the in the second one, and you know this one does. Got a great well, no sunshine, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is definitely it, it's in there as one of those great greatest <laughs> songs of, of all course. time kind of thing. Of course, I recommend it heavily. Highly, um, the first few songs are really good. Takes a little bit of a dive, but the second half is amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's what was shocking. That uh, close to my heart mm. song, in my heart song, it was just yeah. like, what? I was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm thinking like the album just kind of dies at the end because I think the first time I listened to it all the way through, what did you it, just say? What's that? The album um, kind of what? Um, it um, it goes down a little bit. I thought you said it <laughs> dies at the end. Yeah, I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alerts. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, I, I, I just couldn't believe it because I thought 
you know, I, I normally Bill Withers, I had been just like a greatest hits kind of thing. Mm, right. I never dove into like the albums themselves until I heard he passed. I was like, oh, let's put that album on. Because I was also hearing people raving about Grandma's Hands. Mm. Yeah. And um, It's a good song, but it's it's not the highlight. No, no. But I thought, you know, everything was front loaded and that the, the second half of the album was just going to be kind of a throwaway. Mm. I think upon first listening, something happened where I couldn't like finish the rest of it uh-huh. and then i'm listening tonight and this in my heart thing i'm like what the fuck how have i not heard this before this i think i think it was front loaded in a different sense they started with the stuff you were expecting yes and then got interesting you're literally expecting you know the thing about harlem mm-hmm. which is actually an odd choice because this is kind of a, a west coast album isn't it well, at least it was produced West Coast. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where... I don't remember offhand where Withers is from. Probably New York, if he's writing about our own. Yeah, I would think so. All right. That's it for Just As I Am by, by Bill Withers. Rest in peace, Mr. Withers. Withers, thank you. Yes, uh, you've given me a lot to listen to. <laughs> until next time, and we'll be reviewing Zonky by Umphreys McGee. Again, we need a palate cleanser. <laughs> oh, um, that's that's going to be a real crash. <laughs> We, I was considering we have after Umphreys McGee the after after Umphreys McGee, we have um the the one Fox album P H L X um, who were kind of in a similar vein to Withers, and I was thinking about maybe skipping Umphreys or moving them further down and going to Fox next, and then I heard this one and and I really like the Fox album, but I don't want them to be compared to, to this masterpiece. Or and I near just masterpiece. googled it. I just googled it. You'll never guess in a million years where he was born. <laughs> oh, okay, well, just tell me then. West Virginia. Oh, wow. <laughs> Slab Fork, West Virginia. <laughs> okay. Apologies for laughing to anyone who lives there, but uh, I mean, it's a hell of a name. If you live there and listen to this podcast, I mean, I, I don't know what we could do for you, honestly, but I uh, get you a t-shirt because that, mm-hmm. that's fucking great, man. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I'm Freeze McGee next week because like, for the same reason it was going to be after Plant because it's just a palate cleanser that doesn't compare with anything. It's just its own thing and then we can move on. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.